As I said, we celebrate today the, the great and, and glorious Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came down upon the apostles and the disciples. This feast is also called Whit Sunday. You might see that in your missal, which means White Sunday. And this name comes from the ancient custom of, of clothing the newly baptized people in white garments throughout the octave of Pentecost. In the early church, it was customary to baptize people on two main feasts of the year, on Holy Saturday and the Vigil of Pentecost, which is yesterday. So, in order to symbolize the sanctifying grace that the converts had just received in baptism, the new Christians would wear white robes for the entire week afterwards, after their baptism. On this Sunday, we are, in a sense, positioned between our Lord and the Holy Ghost. We've just been redeemed by our Lord, and, and now we're being led by the Holy Ghost. Our Lord has ascended into heaven to be our mediator with God. And the Holy Ghost now comes down onto the earth to guide us and to comfort us here in our exile. Our Lord has gone up into heaven. He has completed the functions of his priesthood, and he goes up to intercede with us with God the Father. And the Holy Ghost comes down to stay with us and to guide the church until the end of the world, to keep it on the path of truth, and to, of course, inflame all of us with divine love. It's the Holy Ghost that fulfills our Lord's promise that the gates of hell would never prevail against the church, because the Holy Ghost protects the church from error. Our Lord has ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us up there. And the Holy Ghost comes down to inspire us to work out our salvation and to overcome our sins. The descent of the Holy Ghost was the fruit of the precious blood of our Lord. It was a, a grace that he merited for us. It was the last step, the, the final completing step in the process of our redemption. The apostles weren't able to receive the Holy Ghost until after our Lord had left this world. St. Augustine says that, that they had developed an excessively human attachment to our Lord. He was their leader and they wanted to follow him. But part of that was only a natural love that was going to interfere with their mission. They had to learn how to, to function without his, his presence among them. And in order to do that, they had to receive the Holy Ghost. But as soon as the Holy Ghost came down, he instantaneously changed them into completely different people. He purified their hearts, and he removed all of their, their earthly attachments, and he inflamed them only with zeal for God and for the church. He took away all of their fear, all their, their, their anxiety. He made them completely forget about their own safety so that they could preach our Lord and, and tell the whole world that he was God and ultimately lay down their lives to prove that and to establish the church. We know by faith that the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and he is their equal in terms of, of power and, and glory and perfection. All three of the persons are equal. Now, as we normally attribute creation to God the Father, we attribute our redemption to God the Son. So we also normally attribute our sanctification to God the Holy Ghost, because God the Holy Ghost is, is the love of the Father and the Son. And all of our grace and sanctification and virtue come from God's love for us. Today is the 50th day after our Lord's resurrection. It's the 10th day after his ascension into heaven when the Holy Ghost came down upon the apostles and the disciples. Pentecost was a great feast for the Jews in the Old Testament, as we hear in the Acts of the Apostles, that Jews had come from all over the world to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. 
what they were celebrating was Pentecost in the Old Testament was the day on which Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And this was 50 days after the Jews had left Egypt. There are a lot of interesting parallels here that, that were set up, of course, by, by the providence of God. The day that the Jews left Egypt, under the, the guidance of Moses, was the day that they celebrated as the Passover every year after that. And at God's command, they, they celebrated this feast every year by eating the Paschal Lamb. So they were freed from slavery in Egypt, and on their way out of Egypt, they went across the Red Sea to get into Asia, and 50 days after they left, after the, the, the Passover event, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So in, in the New Testament, our Lord died on the Jewish feast of the Passover. He was the Lamb of God who was prefigured by the Paschal Lamb. And he led us out of slavery, out of the slavery of sin. And then we went through the Red Sea, which is, of course, the symbol of his precious blood. And now, 50 days after his resurrection, we are again receiving a law. We are receiving the new law of the Catholic Church from the Holy Ghost. But there is a little bit of a difference between these two in the sense that the old law was, was written on tablets of stone and it was given to Moses in the middle of a huge thunderstorm at the top of the mountain. But the new law is not written on stone, it's written on all of our hearts. And it's given in the form of tongues of fire today. And the new law is a law of love and a law of grace. It's intended for, for the children of God, for the Catholic Church. The new law of the Catholic Church is a law that, that has to be something that we embrace in our hearts. It's not something external to us like, like tablets of stone. It has to permeate our hearts all the way through like, like a fire. Where we get hot or if we you know, get burned up in a fire, that heat is in every part of our being and that should be a symbol of how the new law should penetrate every fiber of our being. We certainly see this happen with the apostles, how it penetrated and inflamed them, the, the new law and the, the grace of the Holy Ghost. It was like the gates of heaven were opened and they were flooded with God's love and his mercy. They were filled to overflowing with his grace, and they were so filled with the wisdom of the Holy Ghost that nobody could refute them, nobody could withstand the eloquence with which they spoke. And they were miraculously able to be understood by people of every language. <coughs> That's how important it was that their message be spread to the entire world, that God took away any language barrier that might prevent even a single person from hearing what the apostles had to say so that everyone would hear them speaking in their own language. Before the Holy Ghost came upon them, the apostles were very ignorant and, and weak and, and cowardly and afraid. They ran away when our Lord was arrested in the garden and then St. Peter denied him and even Judas betrayed him and then after our Lord's resurrection, even though he appeared to them many times, they still didn't understand what he was saying to them. And even after his ascension, they were still afraid. They were still hiding in the upper room. But after the Holy Ghost comes upon them, they walk right out of the cenacle and they start preaching to everybody. They're so enlightened by grace that they were finally able to understand and explain to others the most exalted mysteries about God himself. They were able to convince even the most eloquent speakers and refute the most learned philosophers. And they were so courageous that they don't care about any persecution or threat or torment. They went out to the whole world to announce 
the mystery of our Lord. On every great feast day like this, we should meditate on and cultivate the mystery that is being celebrated. So today we should think about the Holy Ghost and what he did for the apostles and what he would do for us too if we would let him and how we can allow him into our hearts too. Because our Lord didn't promise the Holy Ghost only to the apostles. He promised him to all of us, to all of the faithful who are disposed to receive him and who don't put obstacles to his grace. Our Lord said, I will not leave you orphans. I will ask the Father, and he will send you the paraclete, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. And those words are for us too. So if we want to receive the Holy Ghost like the apostles did, we have to prepare ourselves the way they prepared themselves too. We have to retire from the world in prayer the way they did. And we have to pray with confidence and perseverance. But before that, of course, we have to be free from mortal sin at least. The Holy Ghost can't come into our soul if our soul belongs to the devil. The Holy Ghost can't dwell in a place that's already occupied by sin. So whatever sin we have in our heart, we have to get rid of it and, and turn away from it. We have to clean our hearts of any, any hatred or, or malice toward our neighbor, any anger or impurity, pride, rebellion or, or self-love or any other advice that we have. We have to get rid of it. But once we do this, and we ask the Holy Ghost to give us his grace, then he will come into our hearts, not with the same effects that he produced in the hearts of the apostles, not in the form of visible tongues of fire, and he won't give us the, the gift of tongues or of miracles the way he gave the apostles, because these things aren't necessary anymore as they were at the founding of the church. But he still comes into the souls of people who love him and are properly disposed towards him and who want him to come into their hearts and want to be pure of heart. The Holy Ghost is, is God himself. He is a, an inexhaustible fountain of goodness that is constantly flowing and that will continue to flow in, into the hearts of all of the, the good and holy people until the end of the world. The Holy Ghost comes into our hearts in baptism. He gives us the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. He gives us all of the fruits of the Holy Ghost that St. Paul mentions. The Holy Ghost gives us courage in our, our crosses and sufferings. He gives us the strength to carry out the duties of our state of life, the strength to keep the commandments and to overcome temptation. In fact, St. Augustine says that every day can be another Pentecost for us if we want, because we always have it in our power to receive him. We always have it in our power to receive him every day if we are disposed to, if we cooperate with his grace. So if we have been resisting the Holy Ghost, if we've been going against his grace, resisting his good inspirations, or even worse, if we've completely driven him away from us with mortal sin, then today is the day to bring him back into our hearts. And the way we have to do that is by following the words of St. Peter that he preached on the first Pentecost. He said to all of the Jews outside the cynical do penance, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So let us ask him today to take possession of our hearts, to come into our souls, and to stay with us forever. The Holy Ghost is our, our light and our strength. He can strengthen the weak. He can comfort the afflicted. He can give courage to people who are afraid or worn out. He can fire up the lukewarm with fervor, and he can bring even the laziest people to a sense of their duty. 
He can put out the fire of our passions and he can heal any spiritual disorder that we have. He can give us the gift of final perseverance. Let us pray for that today and every day. Let us pray to the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.